When you own any pet, including reptiles, there always comes a day where you have to say goodbye. Sometimes the animal will pass away on its own, and sometimes you have to make that tough decision on your own to euthanize the animal. And that can be one of the toughest decisions that you make in the course of owning the pet. So today I'm going to be explaining to you how to know when it's time to euthanize your snake or other reptile, and how to most humanely euthanize your reptile. First, let me state that reptiles are very hardy, resilient animals. They can bounce back from crazy attacks from predators and health issues, and it doesn't phase them one bit. Sometimes reptiles are born with one eye or no eyes at all. They're born with a slight kink in their back, or sometimes when they are older, they're burned by a heat mat or heat lamp, or even attacked by their prey if they're fed live. And those animals can have just as good of a quality of life as perfectly healthy otherwise animals. It's when the health concern causes pain or discomfort to the snake that impacts its quality of life, where you have to decide to end its suffering by humanely euthanizing the animal. For instance, I had a fox snake that developed a tumor about a quarter of the way down her body, and she could not move the rest of her body past that tumor. She acted fine, but she couldn't move, so she couldn't move from the warm end to the cool end to thermoregulate. So we decided, you know, she does not have a good quality of life like this, and she can't change her own body temperature being a cold-blooded animal, so we decided to euthanize her. Another example was my first hognose snake I got. She developed a mysterious lump about halfway down her body, and we got radiographs or x-rays done. The vet and uh, I couldn't tell exactly what it was, but she acted fine and she could move around, but she couldn't eat. It grew to the point where she would take in a meal, but then she would regurgitate it up so nothing was passing through. So although she was acting healthy, she was just going to starve to death because she couldn't eat anything. So again, we made that tough decision to euthanize the snake. Overall, it's a case-by-case -case scenario and you have to make that decision on your own based on the individual animal's condition. As you may have noticed, I'm not at my house for once. I am at my friend Chris's breeding facility with Triple C Reptiles, and I'm here to show you an instance where, although breeding is usually really exciting, and it is really exciting, there are some times where you hatch a baby snake that you have to decide to cull or humanely euthanize. Chris specializes in breeding leopard geckos and ball pythons, and when he had a ball python hatch recently, he noticed the uh, serious kinks in its spine and let me know so that we could at least use it as an educational experience for you guys, even though it will ultimately be culled. Here's Chris with Triple C Reptiles, and again, we're going to use this as an educational experience for you guys. The snake in particular we're looking at today is what appears to be a super pastel, right? Correct. Okay, well, let's take a look. Its parents were a pastel and a GHI? Correct, and the prior year, she actually didn't lay a clutch, but she was bred to another male that had pastel in him, and ironically, all the babies seem to have came out as super pastels, which is very rare for both parents to pass on pastel to every baby. Although this baby over here looks completely healthy. It's mm -hmm. beautiful too. It's brother or sister and this one is beautiful too, but if you look at her spine, it has some serious kinks down the spine. And again, sometimes snakes can survive with a slight kink, but the main concern is whether the snake can actually pass food through. And I don't think she'd be able to. What do you think? These ones are pretty major, but if you, actually if you look at the back of her body, she's kinked over. Like if you pull wow. her out a little bit, she's, Down here she's too. completely kinked over. Look at these Bad luck. Things. That's such a bummer. Yeah, it I'm is. so like, uh. Although, yeah, she's alert. She's looking around. That front section, yeah, like you said, is fine. But then you get to that 90 degree angle. Yeah. And then that kink. There's, it would just be cruel to right. Even try. let her hang on because yep. she, she wouldn't pass anything and mm -hmm. she would just suffer. Mm -hmm. So if the snake were allowed to live, it probably wouldn't live very long and it would likely just starve to death and that's no way to go. So the decision has been made to cull this snake. Most of the time, kinks in a snake's spine will happen just randomly. It can also be a sign of inbreeding, but we know that these are not inbred because, well, both parents came from completely different sides of the country, right? Correct. So what do you think happened that caused these kinks? Well, the mother, we believe, had an RI this winter. She was treated and never really showed any major symptoms, but she was in quarantine during the last month of her pregnancy. So I'm assuming that it took a toll on the babies. Thankfully, the other one seems to be just fine. 
this snake might be able to survive if it only had these kinks here. It would be a stretch and it would be sold or adopted out as a pet only, of course. And it would have to have very, very small meals for its entire life in order for those meals to pass through. But because of this huge kink towards its the end of its body, nothing would be able to pass through after it's digested. So it would get blocked up, nothing would pass, and it would starve to death because it wouldn't be able to take any more food in. Man, it's times like this where it's like, Ugh, breeding animals or breeding mm -hmm. snakes is tough. Like there's heartbreaking moments like this. So how do you euthanize a snake humanely? Since snakes have such low oxygen level requirements, you can't use the same techniques that you use for like rodents and other animals because the process takes so much longer for snakes to actually pass away. For example, um, CO2 chambers are usually used for rodents to euthanize them to feed to snakes. But because of the low oxygen level snakes need, the process would take so, so long for the snake to finally run out of oxygen and pass away that it would feel like it's suffocating that entire time before it finally dies. So it is not recommended to use CO2 in order to euthanize snakes or any reptile for that matter. Another technique people in the past, and currently some people still do this too, is to put sick animals or sick reptiles in the freezer and they just close the door and check back in a couple of hours and it's passed. This is also not a recommended method because the animal, the reptile, stays conscious during the freezing process. So it feels it when those ice crystals start to form in the tissues of the snake. And that is just about as painful as you can imagine. Another technique is to behead the snake or the reptile, and this is literally what it sounds like. However, without a head, studies have shown that snakes and other reptiles, since they have such a low oxygen level requirement, they stay conscious and can still sense pain for up to an hour after they are beheaded. So that is another technique that we do not recommend using. So how do you do it? I hate to say this because it's kind of gruesome, but crushing the head of the reptile in a quick motion is one way to euthanize because it's instantaneous along with dipping in liquid nitrogen that's another instant euthanization and anything that's fast and quick like that is generally more humane than the longer prolonged deaths since most of us including myself don't have the heart to do that to our pets. Another option is to, of course, bring your animal to the vet where they can provide a lethal injection, which is another humane way to euthanize a, any animal, really. Although the freezer method and the CO2 method and those things sound more inviting and less harmful, it actually is more harmful to the animal. It's just easier for us humans to do those methods. And when it comes to the animal, you want to do what's most humane for the animals. So I, again, don't recommend CO2, freezing, or beheading. So you might be wondering, what's the difference between beheading a snake and crushing a snake's head? Well, beheading a snake leaves all of the organs neck and up intact, so the nerves can still send pain signals to the brain, and that's why the snake is still able to sense pain while it slowly loses oxygen because they have that low oxygen level requirement. Whereas crushing a snake or reptile's skull or head will sever all activity between nerve endings and the brain, and it'll completely halt brain activity immediately. Basically, you want to end the animal suffering as quickly as possible. Here's an example of a snake that has a disability, but it's not worth culling because she can live a perfectly happy and otherwise healthy life. If you look at her tail, this is from a rat who chewed off the end of her tail. But Chris, this doesn't happen here, right? Correct. So I bought her at a reptile show and it wasn't even brought up that she had that and I didn't see it, of course, in her, her container. She's probably curled up covering her Correct. tail. And so when I got home and opened the container, I was like, what in the world? But I mean, you can clearly see it's an old wound. You know, she's an older girl. She's had a couple clutches even here with me. So, I mean, she's missing probably three, two to three inches mm -hmm. worth of her tail. So we're assuming it was a rat or possibly a burn. It's too. probably one or the other. And that doesn't slow her down at all, it no, looks like. No, God, no. <laughs> no, she's a ferocious eater. She's had two clutches with me. So again, snakes are very resilient. Another example of a snake that has an injury but doesn't have to be euthanized is nearly headless snake, my eyeless garter snake. If you're not familiar with him, he got hit by a lawnmower about a year ago and it took off one eye and we had to have his other eye surgically removed because it was swelling up and had a risk of rupturing. But even without any eyes, he tongue flicks, he explores, he eats, he poops, he sheds, he does 
everything that a normal, healthy garter snake would do. So he has just as good of a quality of life as a healthy garter snake, in our opinion, or close to it, other than not being able to see. He just smells around a little bit more. So that's why we decided not to euthanize that snake in particular. Hopefully this video helped you get a better understanding of how to tell when to euthanize a snake and what some of the techniques are to do it and some techniques to not use when euthanizing snakes or other reptiles. And before we leave, let's check out some of Triple C's reptiles. Cute. And this is a Mojave? Yep. Nice. Oh, this is the really white-sided Mojave. Correct. Wow, she is beautiful. This is a female GHI morph, and in case you don't already know, GHI literally stands for gotta have it, because <laughs> who can resist that awesome patterning on that ball python? So this is a banana, lesser inchy, um, with a bunch of paradoxing. That's where all the dark spots come in, so that theoretically is not breedable. So that means that the paradoxing here is completely random, and you cannot predict or breed specifically for it. It just happens sometimes. Correct. And he was produced by JSA Reptiles. He's also a possible het for clown. Wow. Whoa. Here's an exanthic spider. The exanthic gives us that kind of grayscale coloration, and the spider is the beautiful design or pattern. Here we have a cute little ivory mutation ball python. Chris also breeds leopard geckos, and this is a particularly orange leopard gecko, and he is about just as orange as the camera shows. This is a super pastel calico, and if you look right there, she has a little bit of paradoxing too. This is my favorite leopard gecko at Chris's house. His name is Jellybean, and he is a tank. This guy is massive. So we're gonna end with this beautiful leopard gecko for this video. Thanks for watching, and thanks for joining us for a little impromptu tour of some of Chris's animals, and we'll see you next time.